Good morning, everybody. Uh, today we have a very, very, I think, interesting topic, but it's a little bit more than interesting. It's a fundamental topic. Every one of you is in some sort of science career, a budding science career coming up, hopefully for you. And good facts and good science and good explanations for the phenomena around us have never been more important than in the crisis which we're experiencing now with COVID-19. Now, I have spent a lot of time putting this lecture together and it is a very content rich subject. So what I can do in two hours here, or probably less than two hours, because I will actually fall off the chair and you will actually all fall asleep, is to give you some highlights, some bits which you really need to know in order to understand how evolution works. Now, it is very, very important that we have a very, very clear understanding um, here are the learning objectives if you want to read them, but basically I'm going to tell you stuff about evolution and I'm going to tell you how evolution has formed species, what the evidence is for it, and essentially that whole process of speciation leads to biodiversity, which is a you know recurring theme in this course. Now to be very, very clear about what we like to do is uh, this lecture is to give you a very, very strong sense as a biologist that without knowing evolution, you cannot know life. Fundamentally, organic evolution, the knowledge of organic evolution is really the keystone of all biology knowledge. As a matter of fact, we can actually go as far as saying that evolution is the dominant paradigm in biology. There's other paradigms, of course, which apply to physics, such as Newtonian physics uh, and Einstein's laws of relativity, Pauli's uncertainty principle, and so forth, and so forth. But in biology, this is the centerpiece of our knowledge. And essentially, if you try to deny organic evolution, you have to abandon all reason. You have to basically put your mind aside and say, well, I believe in the pink spaghetti monster in the sky who actually created species. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Let's be very, very clear. You can believe whatever you like. I will make no judgment and nor should anybody else, as long as your beliefs are ethically and morally correct and treat every singular human being, irrespective of gender, age, or grade, with respect. Now, but what we need to do is separate belief systems very, very clearly from science. You are going to be scientists, so you cannot go around and basically, in your professional career, proffer beliefs, myths, or whatever you like to call them. You leave this basically at home in your private time. And that is not a question that we don't respect religious beliefs or whatever beliefs you have. It is simply a question that you need to use logic and reason in your professional uh, relationships. You can use beliefs to make you feel happier, to give you explanations uh, about the universe, but you do that privately. There is no point really abandoning reason as a scientist and actually believe in creationism. Now, in order to understand why sometimes evolution can be a little bit tricky and controversial when people have very strong other beliefs, I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining to you the historical context of how we actually came to this grand theory of ours. Now, as a starting point, people for many, many years, probably even some of the very early hominids, would have found fossils. They might have realized 
very early in our cultural evolution that those fossils are the remnants of previous life. Here we actually have two very, very superbly preserved fossils of trilobites, which is a group kind of similar to marine spiders or crustaceans, which actually lived in the Cambrian period and became extinct when the dinosaurs went out. Now, that the fact that people have found for a very, very long time signs of previous life, which hasn't basically carried on into today's world, means that life has a legacy of perpetual change. Species arise, but they can also die off. And in the meantime, they can leave a paleontological record. Now, that is kind of very useful because the Earth's geology does sometimes a very good job in preserving the facts of previous life, the forms, the diversity, even some of the life modes. We also need to be aware right from the outset that evolution takes a long time. Just like geology, we measure things in tens of millions of years. For instance, we spent quite a bit of time uh, in the last lecture explaining to you the phylogeny, the evolution of us, Homo sapiens. And basically about three or four million years ago, did the first hominids arrive somewhere in Central and East Africa. Irrespective of how long it takes, every singular feature on Earth, okay, I got it flower here on my desk is the product of evolution. Well, this flower here is actually the product of domestic breeding, which is basically a sharply accelerated, very uh, directed form of evolution. Right. So we can basically very roughly differentiate or distinguish or recognize three different types of time scales. This is actually the evolution of uh, birds in Hawaii, but never mind, we get to that. Basically, at the scale of years to decades, it depends, of course, on the generation time of the organism, we find that genetic traits, gene frequencies, can change. We will actually go to the mechanisms to uh, which are tied to those changing uh, gene frequencies in about half an hour. It's things like genetic drift, founder effect, mutations, and so forth. When we create, well, not us really, but evolution, uh, create new species, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years. And remember back again, you know, we probably had three, four, that is very, very debatable, major steps in the phylogeny and the de development of humans. And it took about three or four million years to actually get to where we are now. We're probably going rapidly backwards, but never mind. That's just a modern system of politics. Let's look to America or maybe not. And when we actually look a little bit longer at the time scale to tens of million years to hundreds of million years, those are major evolutionary changes and mass extinctions, such as the formation, the radiation, and ultimately the deaths of the dinosaurs. Now, when it comes to how humankind thought about evolution, or I should say in the beginning, had ideas about the history, the legacy, the change of life on the planet as we know it, it is Interesting to note that the early Greeks philosophers, here's a chap called Aristotle, had quite accurate ideas in one sense, and that is that life always changes. It doesn't stay still. So they recognized the malleability, the change, the trajectories, the radiation, the diversification of life on Earth. That was fundamentally the right idea. But then something curious happened in our uh, you know, history. All of a sudden, those quite 
deeply philosophical ideas were replaced by religious dogma. And here is a painting of Noah's Ark. And that's actually a classic one because somehow uh, whoever wrote the Bible recognized that there is a great diversity of animals. So they took two of each and they put it on Noah's Ark and off they sailed probably somewhere in the Caspian or Black Sea and it landed on Mount Ararat, which is nowadays, I think, in, what is it, Armenia? And again, some, some nutters in the state build a replica, which is going to out, go out of Kentucky. No mind. So they recognized that there is diversity, and that diversity has to be preserved in the face of a flood. This is a really, really cool idea. But it was framed as God created all of that six, seven days, whatever. I always sort of think that when God created mosquitoes, he must have had a really bad hangover in one of those days or, you know, just really went off color in his creation term. So it was also a religious dogma, a myth, a superstition, that everything was created in a very short period of time and there was nothing before. You know, the earth was dark and then light came in, blah, blah. That is actually quite interesting because we went from a modern precursor of evolutionary thinking to a religious dogma, which left no place for that. And that religious dogma uh, persisted for quite a long time. Oh, look, you know, ooh, maybe I can actually look like this one day. Ooh, must look the other day. Right? Oh, I should have a, you know, one of those painted. Never mind. Uh, this is Archbishop Usher of Ireland, who in the uh, 17th century, you know, really came up with some extraordinary religious ideas. He actually calculated the age of the earth, and it was supposed to be roughly 6,000 years old. Very, very remarkable, all based on religious beliefs. So that dogma was very, very strong. However, enter a chap from... Uh, France. As a matter of fact, he was a very, very wealthy nobleman who spent his pastime doing zoology. Well, I would like to be a member of the landed gentry and have a grand estate and have deers of all, you know, um, of all types running around and do little experiments, you know, with predators. Never mind. He was George Louis Buffon. Now, Buffon was actually quite cool because he realized and he published on it, that the environment has an influence on how animals are shaped and how they function. Uh, he, he wasn't so keen on the Irish bloke's uh, idea that the Earth is only 4,000 years ago. He extended this to about 70,000 years, which is, of course, based on our knowledge nowadays, quite ridiculous. But it was an interesting development because we started to get away from the middle ages where tenants of faith like the biblical account of the earth creation and then all sort of mythology and superstition started to get replaced by real and reasonable uh, scientific thinking now i should say also because some some of you might you know, have very strong beliefs and might actually sort of go back and say, ooh, you know, this is a bit wet again. Surely based the evidence, we get to the evidence in a minute. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having a belief system to explain to your own little mind uh, how the earth came about and how we as humans came about. Because it is truly interesting, every basic culture on life uh, on earth, and it doesn't really matter what sort of religion they have, has in their basically tales and folklore some sort of creation myth. We are deeply concerned as a species. We want to know where we come from. We want to know what our ancestry is. We want to know geographically how far we spread or where we basically emerged from. So we have a deep-seated desire to get to the bottom of our nature, nature being here used in a very encompassing, wide embracing uh, notion that you know, gets to 
social, cultural, and family ties. So that need for an explanation of life on Earth is a very, very strong one. Right, giraffes. Uh, my daughter is absolutely obsessed with giraffes. I once actually bought her a bag uh, which contained about 600 pieces to make a Lego giraffe. That was actually harder in Sweet East than the buzzard, but never mind. Very, very amusing. So, what do we notice about a giraffe? Well, it looks a little bit like they say a camera is uh, an animal put together by a committee. Yeah, it kind of looks a little bit weird and strange and out of place and awkward. Now, in Afrikaans, which is the language of one of the cultural groups in South Africa, uh, it's called a camel paired, which is a camel horse. Yeah, well, you know, they got one thing right, and that is it really looks like it is put together by a committee as well. And somebody, when they ordered their first parts for giraffes, made a little bit of a typo and actually ordered a neck, which was far too long. But is it? If you actually go and have a look at what giraffes do in Africa, they basically graze uh, the leaves from acacia trees mostly. So basically, they developed a very, very long neck to reach the leaves on trees. There we go. Those are two giraffes which really long for it. You know, they can't really uh, get to it very, very nicely. And then all of a sudden, oh, there's a little giraffe. And I don't know why. You know, it must be her older brother. You know, it looks a bit grumpy. But in any case, mother giraffe is right up there, has a very long neck. So there was then the idea by a chap called uh, Lamarck and Lamarck, actually, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, his ideas about evolution are being embraced now to a certain part in modern uh, genetics. But basically what he said is, well, if an organism adapts to its environment to basically get more food or get more mates or escape predators better, any adaptation, any trait which enhances survival will be passed on to the next generation. So what Lamarck postulated was that if you acquire a certain trait, your descendants, your children will have it also. Now, that's quite a radical idea. And of course, we know from real life um, my daughter is probably quite happy that she's not going to be as nutty as her professor uh, father. It's a little bit disappointing. So I only got you know another you know twenty or thirty years of of, of dead jokes uh, ahead of me. But never mind. That is actually not quite true. Yes, our children look similar, ideally speaking, to us, but we do not actually pass on any modifications of our bodies which we acquired in our lifetime. So if I go to the gym every day and have really, really big you know, biceps for most of my life, or I actually decide to only basically drink beer with my arm outstretched like this, a very, very long arm or very, very big biceps will not be passed on to my children. I can acquire traits, but they're not heritable. So there was a slight mistake in Lamarck's thinking. And Darwin actually refuted that. However, we have now entered a new domain of knowledge, which is called epigenetics. And epigenetics basically says that, yes, the environment can have an influence on how and how often and which genes are expressed in our DNA and hence form proteins that ultimately form our body. It's, of course, not everything, but there seems to be actually some control of the environment on gene activation. Now, before uh, Charles Darwin really had one of many eureka moments, there must be something uh, else which needs to be said. And that is 
geology also had a very, very strange intellectual birth history. And in many respects, you know, people believed, really believed, and you know, they kind of figured somehow in the you know mysterious, superstitious Middle Age, Dark Ages brains that the Earth hasn't really changed. It was created, and there might have been a few cataclysmic events, and that was it. Then there was a, a chap from, I think he was Scottish, uh, Charles Lyell, and he uh, published some really, really interesting and very, very controversial ideas at the time. The one was the principles of geology. Another one was like the antiquity of man, the geological evidence of the antiquity of man. How cool is this? So he was actually quite before Darwin. But what he basically said in 1863, that was, it was that the earth is very old. We're talking about millions of years now, remember? There was an archbishop, one of the highest uh, office bearers in the Catholic Church, who basically said, well, the earth is only uh, uh, basically uh, 6,000 years old. Now, he also went as far to say that, you know what? The same laws of physics and of chemistry apply to geology, irrespective of what age we look at. So the Earth is formed, as we see it today, by a series of continual changes throughout time over millions of years that either formed mountain ranges or eroded them away and then deposited the soil on continental slabs. Interesting idea. He basically said the Earth, as we see it today, is not the form it always has. It basically is quite... Uh, it basically has quite a tumultuous hist history uh, that changes occurred. Now, here to, you know, uh, this one, I mean, it looks a bit like Santa Claus who lost his costume. And, and actually, Charles Darwin got a really round head. I only noticed yesterday. But it's really quite nice, you know, it's, you know, those kind of, you know, sideburns. Maybe I should actually grow some. Probably not, you know. But, uh, I would have to sleep in the doghouse. Never mind, but I thought I, I, I take one of those cravats because Charles Darwin has one. Yeah, so here we go. So here's Charles Darwin and here is Edgar Wallace. Now it, it just happens that both of them had very, very similar ideas, completely independent from each other. That is actually very reassuring. So what Charles Darwin brought to the party is a wealth of evidence for evolution. And he also was the first one to really synthesize this knowledge in a very, very strong, coherent, logic and encompassing theory that can explain the natural world. Now, I must say at this point that the way we use in science the word theory is very different to how we use it in everyday life. In everyday life, theory basically means like, um, oh, we're not quite sure what's happening there. There is quite a lot of room for uh, empirical variation of what might happen. Now, in science, a theory means it's a consolidated body of evidence built from many observations, built from experiments, built from ex uh, empiric effects, and then synthesized into a model that has explanatory powers for uh, uh, investigating the world before us. And importantly, it is a testable one. We can actually test the predictions of a theory. We can never do this with you know, religious beliefs, but that's okay. They're actually something completely different. Now, philosophy of science dictates, and I just actually finished reading this book. It's very, very cool. Uh, if you want to actually buy it, there, you know, illustrated history of thought is that logically speaking there might always be a room for some variation so we can never be a hundred percent sure as humans that we have all the facts explained all the time and that's what we actually call it a theory but that's okay because it actually makes us humble it makes us realize that Absolute knowledge is a logical fallacy, but it's okay. That's how life works. So Darwin, basically, he actually trained as a minister 
for the Church of England. Can you believe it? And then he basically uh, finished his degree in, uh, I think it was Cambridge and, oh, was it Oxford? Can't remember now. Never mind. One of the two Cambridge or Oxford or uh, Oxbridge universities. And he said, well, I, I'm not really too keen on working as a minister. And it just happened to be the case that an expedition left uh, for the Americas, the South Americas, and Darwin basically said, oh, can I come and jump on board? So he joined this vessel, the HMS Speedy, and he made a five-year uh, scientific discovery voyage. Now, what is really quite cool, that Darwin took to observing natural effects in a completely new fashion. He did it very, very systematically. And he also worked on geology. He worked on coral reefs. It wasn't just like finches or you know, uh, the plants and the tortoises of Galapagos. He was a all consuming and all basically encompassing natural historian. And what he basically did was observe life forms and the geological processes forming the habitats in multiple locations. Now, this is quite an impressive uh, map of where the little beagle went. So it went down out of Portsmouth, down across the uh, Atlantic from, you know, I think I stopped at the Cape Verde Islands. We were actually meant to go there uh, this year, but of course nobody can go anywhere, bloody hell. And then it went to down the coast here. And where he really, oh, we went to Valparaiso this February. What a fantastic place. I can only recommend going there uh, whenever you have the chance. And then he cut up to the Galapagos Islands, and of course, much of his ideas about evolution were formed there. And then coming back via Hobart, you know, might have had a point to do at Salamanca Place and, you know, uh, the tip of Western Australia, Oceus, and back from the Cape of Good Hope, which was at the time uh, a Dutch uh, colony up to Ascension Island and back home. Now, when he actually landed at the Galapagos Islands, he was stunned to find this massive long-lived tortoises. As a matter of fact, the Spaniards called those islands the Il de Galapagos, and that basically means the island chain of the turtles. And those turtles were already, when Charles Darwin went there, these turtles were already fairly, fairly uh, heavily exploited. Uh, seafarers killed them because a big turtle, you can turn on its back and it provides fresh meat and even you can drink the blood for many months at sea. And extraordinary large turtles in extraordinary, you know, high numbers. So this was quite stunning. But what really, you know, I think is often credited with being the uh, primary driver of his thoughts is that uh, he observed the extraordinary diversification of finches on different islands. We get to that in about 10 minutes. Now, when he came home, he uh, published a, a little journal, you know, a little uh, a account of his voyage, which, which was called A Naturalist's Voyage Around the World, The Voyage of the Beagle. And I think it sold out on the first day. So people were really, really hungry at the time for a different kind of knowledge, being geographically, being bio biologically, being geologically. And Darwin was the man to publish this. Now, in this book, which was really an account of his no uh, voyage, he didn't really synthesize as strongly yet the ideas of evolution. As a matter of fact, it took uh, quite uh, a while for Darwin to very carefully piece together the evidence um, for, uh, for his theory. Now, while he did this, he read a very, very influential book uh, by Robert Malthus. It's called An Essay on the Principle of Population as it affects the future improvement of society. Now, when I looked this up, I saw one at Christie's, which is an auction house in London, they sold one off for the princely sum of seven, nearly 70,000 pounds. Wow. 
So that's about, you know, 150,000 uh, Australian dollars for an original print. It's a print that were actually multiple ones produced. Now, Maltus was what we think nowadays, of course, we think, oh, this is quite obvious. But at the time, he proposed something quite radical. And that is, if a population is unchecked, when there are no limits, it will grow exponentially and eventually outlive the resources it has to sustain itself. But that doesn't really happen in nature and in society. So there seems to be limits to how uh, large and how quickly we can grow. We, of course, you know, push those limits all the time with better medicine, with better agriculture, with different forms of housing, with different types of transport. But it's basically cultural evolution. That was very, very important for Darwin's thinking at the time. Darwin also, you know, uh, pondered domesticated animals. Now, we are, as humans, quite weird, I have to say, by uh, breeding domestic animals into all sorts of fantastic shapes. So breeding is, of course, a form where we pick a particular trait, feathered legs, why a pigeon should have feathered legs, I leave that up to you to decide, and then amplify that trait throughout generations. That what cattle breeders do, what dog breeders do, what cat breeders do, what pigeon breeders do. So he realized that biology, a biological process of selective reproduction can uh, basically lead to what almost looks like different species. It can enhance and multiply certain features in a population. He doesn't quite know how this would actually, how it actually works. He only knew from practice, we as humans have already discovered that traits are being passed on from generation to generation. Right. Now, a great surprise came to me when I put together this lecture that you can find the original paper of Darwin and of Wallace as it was published by the Linnean Society. As a matter of fact, I put it up uh, for you to read, but you can actually access it here. But what you will see is that Darwin didn't write this by himself. He also had Alfred Wallace, who was a naturalist who worked what is nowadays Malaysia and Indonesia on biogeography. You might have heard about the Wallace line, which is a, a, a demarcation, one should say, between two uh, various prominent, between two very prominent biogeographic uh, provinces. Now, why did Darwin publish this together with Wallace? Darwin wanted to write a four volume big book on evolution. And then somebody said to him, oh, mate, uh, I heard that Alfred Wallace is going to publish a paper uh, which more or less resembles your ideas. So Darwin said, mm, you know, what we should do is I retract mine and Alfred Wallace, who is first, should actually go and take all the glory. And then his friends uh, convinced him, so, ah, just be a nice boy and do it together. So they published this paper together, and that set really out uh, the theory of evolution. And I think it very fundamentally changed the course of mankind when it came to biological knowledge. So essentially, uh, that was the first uh, four-page summary. And then in 1859, uh, Darwin went all out and wrote a book uh, called on the origin of species by means of natural selection. And basically, this changed the course of history. He laid out his ideas very, very clearly, very logically, and very sequentially. Because there's actually a little bit of a subtitle here, and it basically says, ooh, you know, uh, the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Now, uh, this is actually, of course, something very, very new at the time, and the church and the clergy just went ballistic mad. So we have to actually think now, uh, what are the 
what is the evidence for uh, evolution as Darwin saw it? Well, the first line of evidence. The first line of evidence comes from fossils. Now, several part, in several parts of the world, fossils are extraordinarily well preserved. Now, this is actually from China, and you can see the claws here. Can you see this? This is a velociraptor. This is like in uh, Jurassic Park, the ones which actually went across the paddock running very fast and yeah, get the humans and then devour them. Oh, long tail to balance, extraordinary long legs. Look at this big head with the big jaws, but those claws are amazing. But, and we have what I already showed you in the first one, big, big concentrate, uh, big invertebrates in extraordinary detail in the fossil record. And uh, another cool uh, fossil line of evidence is insects which are preserved in Plant resin, we call this ember, and in extraordinary, fascinating detail, you can actually study them. You can even extract DNA from it. So Darwin basically came up with the thesis that life as we know it always changes. That was quite radically at the time, because everybody believed that the Earth was created, and you know we had whatever how many species uh, you know fitted onto Noah's Ark later on, and tell you how everybody went forth and nothing ever changed. It also means that the world is never constant, but it's always perpetually changing. But it has a hereditary component. So essentially, we are the products of our history. I'm the product of my family, uh, 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 basically uh, ancestry, and so is everybody else. And I would have acquired traits from somebody you know, a few thousand years ago, and so has everybody else. So essentially, we are just the end point in a long ancestry where things changed and tumbled and were uh, basically uh, subject to uh, natural forces that shaped our genetic makeup. So fossils are, of course, a perfect line of evidence. It's great having fossils. Sometimes fossils are so well preserved that they almost you know, give you a bit of a creepy feeling. This is on a glacier at the border between uh, Italy and Austria. Of course, the Italian says, oh, it was ours, the Austrian said, no, it was ours. So essentially, somebody went on a bit of a hike, and the glacier melted in a particular part uh, very strongly during the summer. And he found this body sticking out. And this is the Iceman Utzi. Now, last year we actually went to the museum. You can actually see him. And he's only like half a meter away. And it's in this uh, chamber, you know, nicely lit. And of course, you know, at zero degrees. So, I mean, it was so extraordinary. I even found a little backpack. And he carried moss. And he ca carried tinder to actually, well, he wasn't on tinder. He carried tinder. Well, it's quite interesting. Utzi the Iceman had tinder. I was all about that one. Uh, uh, and, you know, he had shoes and stuff, you know, and, and clothing. And so he was murdered on the top of a mountain going from one valley to the next. Fascinating stuff. But, I mean, the, the wealth of information it basically gives us is extraordinary. But it also shows us that, yes, we were not. No, we were not created yesterday. We have a long, long, long history. And it's a history of change. Now, we have to be careful, of course, because the uh, fossil record is somewhat incomplete because uh, fossilization favors uh, the preservation of hard structures, bones mostly. Soft-bodied animals can, however, also uh, leave traces such as, you know, where they walk over soft mud. Even we left those. Remember I showed you the footprints in the ash near a... Uh, uh, volcano in East Africa made by early hominids. Uh, but what is also important is that the fossils are layered. We can basically work out how old they are because mountains are continually uh, throughout the Earth's history eroding. The sediment comes down and actually builds up, builds up, builds up. And then basically it preserves fossils in layers. 
What is really cool, I found this article, is we always sort of, ah, you know, fossils are dinosaurs and uh, maybe a few big invertebrates like those trilobits I showed you, maybe a few ammonite shells. But somebody actually found preserved jellyfish. I mean, this is really, really cool. And look at them. They are in extraordinary detail. I never thought that a fossil jellyfish could exist. This is actually a few into the bell from the mouse upwards. So the fossil record, the more we dig, the more we spend time looking into the past, the more fossils we find and we can piece together uh, life on Earth. And those fossils are often very different to the life forms that we see today. Now, during my master's at the University of Vienna, I also you know, contributed a little bit to paleontology because I worked on the ear stone of uh, opossum shrimp and those ear stones, or balance stones, I should say, they look a little bit like this, they're then actually preserved in the paleontolo paleontological record. Now we know a lot about the uh, age identification of particular geologic layers because the oil industry and other mining industry looking for gold and uranium, whatever, they have figured out that only certain, uh, uh, only, only certain rock, only rocks of certain age, and particularly the layers in between are usually oil and gas bearing and or uh, contain gold. So some fossils in Earth's history can actually be used some biological remains to age rocks very, very uh, nicely because they are characteristic of certain layers. Uh, if you actually don't believe me uh, uh, about, you know, layering is uh, you should really, really be careful ever to go anywhere as a uh, biologist because they're always kind of crazy. I mean, I look at this kind of things and everybody's, oh, this is kind of nice colors. But I would say, oh, look at all the layering and this is Precambrian and this is Ordovician and, oh, maybe here this is actually indicating the big meteorite crash which got the dinosaurs. So, Basically, you bore everybody completely to death, you know, uh, with geological knowledge. It's all about layering. I mean, think about, you know, a layered cake, a tiramisu, or a cocktail, or whatever. And we can actually work out what the ages are from radio uh, dating of certain elements, which decay at a known rate. So by measuring what the decay product is relative to the original product, we can actually work out how old it is. So we actually know the ages of rocks, either from the observed layering or uh, uh, radioactive decay dating methods. Cool. And that is important because in order to reconstruct life, we need to know when a certain species flourished and when it became extinct. It also, uh, Darwin also recognized that there are certain evolutionary trends. So, you know, basically, uh, there is a change of species, there's a change of life forms, there's a change of anatomy, there's a change of population size. Some species flourish for a certain time. I mean, look at the Australopithecus boci or Robustus boci, I think, are from South Africa. This is Homo habilis. They, they, they lived like, you know, a million of years ago, a million of years. That's a long time. And then they actually die out. But other ones basically, uh, in the meantime, flourish and develop, such as Homo erectus, but he dies out. And here is Homo neanderthalensis and Heidelbergiensis. They, the Neanderthals, actually uh, lived at the same time as the sapiens. But look at our brain cavity relative to, you know, the face, we just basically became smarter and replaced all the other hominids at the time. So essentially, you know, the duration of species in the geological record is valuable and we can, uh, we come back to that time and time again. So the fossil trends clearly, clearly demonstrate Darwin's principle of perpetual change. Here's another example. If you ever go, you know, to with any biologist to Southern Africa, they will also bore you to death because you know we got various uh, antelopes. Those ones are called the Blesbok group, and they have this 
you know, very distinctly shaped horns, and then there's the impalas, which are, of course, the main food of lions, and so forth, and so forth. But horns also remain very, very prominently in the geological record. And what we can actually reconstruct from that is that, you know, species uh, flourish on the savannas and the grasslands for a time, and then they die out. But other ones form, and they actually persist to the present day. So, because we have fossils, we can trace, document, observe, catalog, classify, call it whatever you like, the change of life over time. Now, that's actually quite a cool evidence for evolution. Things didn't be created yesterday, and, you know, everybody has an ancestor. We all have a history. Now, some of them hide it much better in their cupboards than others. But we all do have a history. Very, very reassuring and sometimes maybe not so much. Now, a classic case uh, of perpetual change and also one uh, of change which seems to indicate that certain features have a directional trend. So we actually, once uh, evolution has hit on a good solution in its early phases, it tends to emphasize those traits further and further. Horses are also extremely well preserved in the paleontological record, and they go back many, many years, about 55 million years ago, much older than us. We would actually have overlapped with horses, you know, wild horses, only up here from about 3 million years ago. And we might have only sort of had you know, the early ancestors of the equus family. So, but what basically happened with horses is over time they became bigger, they reduced their toes, and essentially they got really big molars for grinding down tough cellulose material. And we can actually follow this really cool. I mean, here, here's the molars. I mean, look at the size of the molars in a modern horse. Yeah, there is, of course, many horse jokes as well. Um, this is actually what I really miss doing uh, those, you know, online recordings. You know, sometimes in you know, the audience, really, somebody in the audience really prompts me, prompts you to, or reminds you of a joke. Um, never mind, they don't really work that well uh, online. Uh, so, uh, and also the early horses had about uh, three toes, and then over time the middle bone, you know, became the main static bearing organ and the other ones became vestigial. Right. The fossil record also tells us uh, something about the change of biodiversity and of the presence of different animal groups over time. Now, those are sponges. Never mind about sponges. They don't actually do very much. We can observe them nicely during the paleontological record because they leave their skeletal material in form of little spiky things uh, behind. One, actually, of those is named after my daughter, uh, Isabella Mirabilis. This is actually the bad thing. Having a uh, biology, a biologist as a, uh, as a parent, they actually name species after you. That's kind of nice. But it's not a very good uh, looking sponge, but never mind, she actually has one. And then, you know, we, we got the corals and look at the gastropods, the snails. They really exploded in, uh, and so did the clams. Uh, those are the squid and octopus, those are minor phyla. And as we actually go along here, we basically see that it is uh, sea urchins which is also larger crustaceans, shrimps, lobsters, that kind of stuff, crabs, uh, and particularly the fishes. Look at the fishes, how they expanded, how they multiplied in diversity over time. And then we have the reptiles, and of course, age of the dinosaurs, that's when they actually you know, started to die out here. And we are only a blip in the last few moments of evolution, but we have become very, very diverse and very successful. Remember what I told you about the amazing uh, variety of shapes and forms of mammals, but we're only really in the last few million years. 
many other life forms are much older. But what I try to say here is illustrate here is that concept that hardly anything ever stays the same. Right. Another principle is uh, that we have ancestors. Now you might say, oh, you know, in 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 paleontological time, you might say, no, that's well, this is fairly obvious, really. Well, it wasn't really, and many people, certain people, still do not actually believe this. Now, it is very very simple, really. Uh, every species is the product of having been formed by splitting off, so to speak, from a common ancestral line. But that also means we can actually follow it back here and uh, discover what our roots are. And you know, there is much you know, um, you know, debate who was really the ancestor uh, that unites you know, uh, uh, the great apes, here's the chimpanzee, from uh, the humans. And it actually doesn't matter that much, you know, what it actually looked like. What we can actually do is the logic of a, you know, bifurcated split. So everybody has a forebearer. That is very, very important because evolution predicts that life evolved by, you know, new species forming from material that was already there. So we have a common descent. Every species has a common descent. And as humans, we can trace ourselves back, 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 back uh, here. And that would have been a common ancestor, which actually uh, evolved from uh, basically amphibians and reptilians. Right. Uh, another line of evidence concerns comparative anatomy. And actually, uh, <laughs> the, the example I want to give here is how the limbs of vertebrates uh, evolved for different functions, but they still, we can still trace back to the shape of the bones and their position in the body that they all have a common origin. And when I actually looked at this, I came across this YouTube video, which basically says, what would actually happen if birds had arms? Look at this, this is pretty cool. Right, I think we get the idea. <laughs> so, right. So, much less entertaining is a diagram like this. And it's only really there to actually show to you that we can trace back the anatomy, the same structures in different animals, even though they have evolved into different uses. And if we have the same organ uh, present in different organisms and it comes in a variety of forms and shapes and we can work out what it was originally, it basically is a very, very good prima facie evidence, which means on first principles, uh, evidence of evolutionary change. And there's many of those you know, examples of homologies uh, when I was a student at zoology in Vienna, uh, one of our professors, you know, was the world is already on homology. So we got tortured with this, like, like, uh, like, like, like nobody else. Our vertebrate anatomy lab classes were eight hours, four days a week for one year. So, but we got to actually dissect everything. We even dissected an elephant and an anaconda, you know, because what they did is. They had an agreement with all the zoos in Europe. Everything which died was basically shipped to the uh, anatomy department in Vienna. And then, you know, every second year, we basically uh, dissected the whole lot. Quite fascinating, but we lost a lot of friends because, you know, you spent like eight hours in a formal end, which is a very aggressive, uh, preservatives, uh, saturated atmosphere, and, and kind of your, your, your nose, uh, 
uh, your sensory capabilities in your nose kind of got very, very badly damaged, you know, by those, uh, by those chemicals. And I think we all smelled. So we only, you know, tended to actually have friends who were also comparative anatomy guys. Never mind. Uh, I did a reacquire uh, my sense of smell and, you know, became a professional competitive wine taster. But that's a different story. Any case, now, uh, here is another one. And that is, you know, we can trace our ancestry back. And Charles Darwin was the first one. Uh, to propose that idea. And of course, he was just basically inviting a firestorm. It's a bit like putting something out, you know, which is a little bit controversial on Facebook and all the tropes come in. But he was really bombarded with criticisms. As a matter of fact, I think he was quite ridiculed. So you can see this on, on this kind of uh, advertisement, which says, if I'm Darwin's grandpapa, it follows, don't you see? That what is good for man and beast is doubly good for me. So basically, the company uh, uh, tries to say, like, well, you know, what Darwin is actually telling us that those are our forebears. Well, uh, nowadays, no sane biologist with a reasonably intact set of logically thinking capabilities can actually deny that. And Basically, we can either, you know, uh, use the comparative anatomy one uh, approach. We can use uh, evidence from paleontology. I showed you uh, how extraordinarily well-preserved fossils of the Australopithecus we found, of Australopithecus africanus, and, uh, you know, nicknamed Lucy. But today, of course, we have DNA evidence, and basically, you know, our DNA uh, sequences, uh, the gene sequences, or the base sequences, I should say, are 99% similar to chimpanzees. So that is quite remarkable. Now, here is another really, really curious uh, line of evidence. And that actually concerns ontogeny. Ontogeny is how an organism changes throughout this life. Embryology is basically a science of how an organism uh, changes during the development in the womb. Now, here's a fish, it's a shark, the regular sharks, and they have gill slits. So uh, primitive vertebrates such as sharks have traditionally, most of them, five gill arches and five gills. Now you might say, hmm, what has this got to do with sort of us as humans and evolution? I don't have gills. Well, we have a saying, we are a little bit green behind the gills. This, of course, comes when you go and buy a fish, always check that A, the gills are still in, and B, you must check uh, the color of the gills. There should be a ruddy kind of red. If they're actually getting onto the right side or the green side, the fish is basically rotten and too old. And when we actually say, oh, yeah, we're a bit green behind the gills, that possibly uh, refers to a rather tumultuous Friday or Saturday night. Uh, but you say, well, but we have actually lungs, so surely that is not uh, of any relevance to me. Well, not quite. Here is a shark, and here is a human embryo. Now you can see the nose from and you can see the big eye forming. This is the umbilical cord. Here is our forelimbs, the vertebrate column, the back limbs. So in embryology, this is the yolk sac. In embryology, we actually have a tail, but more importantly, we got gill slits. This is a real photograph, okay? So you can't actually doctor this or, you know, try to produce evidence, you know, by, uh, you know, nefarious means. Humans and sharks have gills. That's quite remarkable. As a matter of fact, if you look at the early ontogeny of vertebrates, here's a human, here's a bird, here's a lizard, here's a raven fish, we basically look very, very much the same in our very early stages, in about a week or so in. So essentially that principle was, uh, that observation was made by a German biologist, uh, Ernst Teckel, 
And he basically said, well, ontogeny, the development of an organism throughout time, is a replay, press the replay button of the phylogeny, which is the ancestral uh, lineage or lineages of an organism. So essentially, uh, a species recapitulates or repeats its phylogenetic history during ontogeny. I mean, I actually think this is really cool. Right, beetles. Why do I put beetles up here? Uh, there's a famous quote, of course, uh, and that is uh, when a, a scientist, you know, I think it was Helden, was uh, asked by a theologian, uh, by a man of the gloss, what he actually thinks uh, of the creator when he looks at nature, and he said, well, God must have an inordinate fondness of beetles because he created so many in such a diversity. That basically asks us the question then, or poses the question, how do different species emerge in such variety uh, through evolution? Another famous example is, of course, the finches of the Galapagos Islands in different species and so forth. So the first thing we actually need to answer here, or as a precursor, um, what's in a name? We quite often talk about species this and species that, but very few, uh, and you should actually do this as a biologist, sit back and say, right, what is a species and how is that important for biology? Of course, in the classics, Romeo and Julia, he basically said, that's what we call, that which we call a rose, by any other name, would smell as sweet, Shakespearean, but we're actually a lot more restricted. When we talk about species, I, I put a moon here, uh, only because, uh, you know, moons are, of course, hybrids between horses and donkeys, and they are infertile, so you can't actually make another mule by crossing two mules because they, their offspring is non-viable, but they can hybridize. So that is important, and, and I only put that in here because my family once had this great idea of making a roaring business success by carrying goods up to Alpine huts using a mood. Now, the only problem was the mood has had half the time very, very different ideas, and quite often sort of half out them out decided to go home again. There's nothing you can do to change a mood's mind. Any case, uh, a species concept, there's different species concepts floating around, but typically it must have one or more of the following criteria. Uh, species, members of a species have a common ancestor uh, throughout paleontology and history. But much more important in a modern sense is to have reproductive barriers. So I'm just looking out the window and there's two minor birds and a few a bin chicken and a, which of course a white uh, ibis and a few magpies. Now you can't cross a magpie with an ibis because they're different species. They have reproductive barriers. So they're actually isolated from each other, that genetic material, because reproduction doesn't happen. And if it does happen, the offspring are not viable except for a few very closely related ones, such as horses and donkeys. Uh, it also means that, by and large, the genetic identity and the morphological shape and form of the individuals within a species population are maintained, and they are often quite different from other species, rather and more similar within uh, the same species. But it's actually those reproductive barriers and the common ancestry which define species. So let's keep this in mind, particularly the reproductive barriers. So there is genetic variation within a species. Now, you know, I look a certain way. Everybody in this class looks in a particular way. If you would actually repeat this class in Russia, they would look different as well. So they would in Japan, in uh, Botswana, and in Chibuti, doesn't matter where we go in the world, people look different. But we're all the same species. 
but we have genetic variation. And it's actually very, very important because essentially uh, we are the same species. We have no reproductive barrier. And that also actually puts a very, very, I think, uh, I would say, different light on some of government policies who actually really are very, very uh, uncivil, and I should say, and immoral and unethical for other people of our race. But let, let me not get started on that one, because we are basically all the same. And that little bit of genetic variation which we have, and any other species which has, is the cornerstone to forming new ones. Right, what that is basically means we can form a new species if we branch off from an existing one. So there's this lineage idea again, this common ancestry. And if that actually happens is quite often the total number of species increases in time, but most species usually by some sort of catastrophic geologic event will actually become extinct again. So how do we actually make a new species? Well, I, <laughs> uh, when I sort of thought, what are reproductive barriers? Yeah, what about this one? What about that one? Uh, every now and then I, uh, as a joke, grow a moustache, but I'm not going to show you a picture. And that definitely at home is a reproductive barrier. But it's of course not that. Um, in, in nature, we have various biological features that prevent species from interbreeding, either they do not recognize each other, or basically their reproductive organs do not fit, or when they're genetic, they're not compatible, or uh, when uh, essentially their behavior is not right or whatever. Now, that actually poses a question. How did we ever get, how do we actually start that branching off, right? How do we develop a, uh, a reproductive barrier. Well, the prime mechanism is, right, we need to separate uh, different uh, fractions, so to speak, of the population. And that can actually be done usually geographically. It takes quite a long time for those reproductive barriers to develop. And if the parts of the population which were separated by geographic by a geological event, usually one oceanographic one, come together again, then interbreeding occurs and all that idea of forming a new species by branching off is out the window. Now there are some really extreme cases. Uh, I always uh, wanted to go there and I will once the flights resume again. This is a pigeon, the Tutura pigeon, which is basically the uh, uh, Gambia ground pigeon, which is one of the rarest birds in the, in the world, and it occurs in one of the most isolated places on Earth. There's only 200 of them left on a tiny, on a few tiny little islands. They look something like this. This is a classic atoll. There is the inner lagoon, there is the outer ocean, a bit of a coral reef, a few coconut palms. Those are passages going in and out. And so, forth. so very isolated. And I love this picture. I sort of thought, mm, how do I, how do you go, how do I show you how isolated that particular population is? Well, we are kind of here and you can actually play around with Google Earth. I encourage everybody to do that. As a matter of fact, yeah, in any case. So, so, so we are right here. This is New Caledonia. This is Fiji. This island here. I'm not quite sure what that is. That could be a bit of a geographic kind of nuisance. I think they do play rugby occasionally, but of course they are not the current world champion, but let's not go into that. Uh, and here is the Sea of the uh, uh, Cortez and Los Angeles would be up here, California. And right in the middle, and you can play around in Google Earth, right in the middle is the Gambia uh, Islands in the south of French Polynesia. And this is, of course, a prime example, 200 birds on a very isolated uh, part of the world. Uh, you can't get more isolated than that in a very distinct habitat. Well, that basically is a superb case of what we call allobatric speciation. Allo means in a different, batria means house, so in two different houses. 
And basically, it refers to a population of individuals, firstly, in a, initially becoming um, uh, being the same species and then being basically distributed or dispersing to isolated habitats, they can start evolving reproductive barriers. And when that actually occurs, we have a classic case of allopatric uh, speciation. And that happens because the separate populations, they evolve independently, they adapt to different environmental conditions, and essentially they become so distinct that when you would bring them together, they would actually not uh, uh, produce viable offspring. And that is, of course, one of the prime criteria for a species. So basically, allopatric speciation is the geographic separation of species populations that eventually then go onto their own little trajectories of you know, acquiring traits that would eventually form reproductive barriers. And those, uh, this geographic uh, separation is often called a vicariance or a vicariant event that happens based, uh, usually uh, is driven by, by, by differences in, in climate or in geology. And I show you a classic example. This is the island of uh, Hobart, uh, sorry, <laughs> of Tasmania. And look what actually happened to the sea level over time. Uh, this is basically um, uh, how the sea level rose after the last uh, in, uh, glacial low point, which was about 150 meters lower. And it was actually all part of Victoria. And they only got isolated because the sea level rose. So species on Tasmania would actually now all of a sudden be separated from their uh, brothers and sisters on the mainland. It's almost fascinating. I mean, I, I used to spend quite a bit of time in, in Tasmania. And Tasmania, of course, they always talk about on the mainland, right? Um, so do you actually know, here, here's a good Tasmanian joke. You know, at the Royal Hobart Easter Show, which is, of course, the main, you know, show event, agricultural event in Tasmania, they don't actually have any ticket booths anymore. And why is that? Well, because the entire island can go in on one family ticket. Never mind. So essentially, uh, those sort of fragmentations that can occur in several species simultaneously, particularly when we have a large geologic event like this. What contributes also to allopatric speciation uh, is what we call a founder effect. And that is a small number of individuals can disperse to a distant place from an ancient population, let's say, on the mainland. And because the founders can develop independently, a different uh, genetic makeup can arise. And also because they might sometimes only carry a subset of the genes with them. And that subset of the genes is all that is available then and the species evolves independently. All right, how do I get out of this? Right, a another form of reproductive uh, barriers can occur if you have a situation where reproduction is not viable or does not happen because the behavior which uh, is necessary for mating or mate attraction uh, doesn't work or actually has evolved into very different behaviors. Now, this is actually quite curious because throughout the animal kingdom, we have many, many examples of uh, mating behavior or mate attraction behavior, sexual, sexual selection, call it whatever you like. And I show you one example where you go like, wow, the world has really gone mad. I mean, some species have developed the most extraordinary behaviors to A, recognize a mate, to make a, a, a prospective partner recognize it as a member of the same uh, species, be attracted to it, and prevent other individuals who not belong to the same species mating with the potential mate. So we basically have this extraordinary 
a variety of signaling and attractant behaviors. But it's actually designed to separate us behaviorally from other species, not us like, you know, birds and uh, other vertebrates. Well, we, we might actually do the same, really, if you come to think about it. So let's have a look at this. This is really quite cool. Right, I think we got the idea. So it's quite extraordinary to which lengths and nature has gone to develop reproductive behaviors in, oh, uh, come on, little boy. So we also have got uh, the other thing, which is the other uh, variety, and this is species can hybridize. And this is basically when they lose their productive barriers or they're not really strong enough, or they're being brought together from previously separated ones. Uh, and of course, they look you know, intermediate. There's another thing which is basically uh, called sibling species, which are species that are, by all accounts, uh, we have quite difficulty distinguishing them uh, based on their appearances, but they actually do have uh, uh, reproductive behavior, usually in terms of the season timing of reproduction uh, or in terms of sensory uh, capabilities, behavior, or chemical signals. Here's a case of salamander. If you mix this one with that one, you get that one. Not really rocket science. Now, here's something quite curious. I Most people would actually say, well, that actually works quite well. I can understand how species are formed when the populations get separated and then evolve independently. But how do they actually get formed if they're all in the same place. And we have evidence for that from, you know, a few lakes in the world. And here's a classic one. This is Lake Malawi, and it's a uh, landlocked African country, but it has the most thousand one of the great Rift Valley lakes. Of course, the Rift Valley goes up here, and this is the cradle of mankind, all the way up here to basically Israel. And when you go to Lake Malawi and you go diving in this freshwater lake, the thing which really, really strikes you is this extraordinary diversity of cyclic fish. And there's hundreds of species, but they're all in the same lake. So how does this actually work? When you actually have populations of different species in the same place and they form new species, it's called symmetric speciation. So different individuals within a species become over time specialized in occupying different niches, ecologically opportunities, so to speak. And if that habitat affinity is a very, very strong one, and it occurs in a single geographic area, those individuals can achieve sufficient, you know, physically and adaptive separation to eventually lead to reproductive barriers. Now, non allopatric speciation, is much rarer, but it actually is occurring. And we have evidence from, you know, Lake Malawi. And the same thing basically occurs in Lake Baikal, which is of course in Russia, which is here. Uh, again, a big lake, I think it's the deepest lake in the world. I uh, can't remember quite now, 3000 meters or something like that, extraordinary. And you have all these different sculpins looking very similar, but they have evolved over time uh, reproductive barriers by uh, basically having different colorations so the females don't recognize the males and they go into different depths and they also live in different basically uh, uh, sediment types, always different sediment types. And finally, you can have a, a mixed code, it's called barometric speciation. A classic case is between the Oreos in, I think this is Trump land or something like this, you know, Donald land. Uh, and we have the um, the, the Western Oreos, and then we have the uh, the Eastern one, and hybrids develop in the uh, overlapping area along the border, and there is some idea that over time, those uh, individuals in that hybrid zone will eventually develop into new species. Now, uh, another problem you have, if you're a really engaged and really enthusiastic uh, biologist, is that you cannot actually look at certain features without immediately thinking about something about science. And it's very sad, it's very nerdy. But every time I see a fountain, I go like, oh, 
What about this? Here, 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 here. Uh, you get the idea? Because there is numerous examples in biology textbooks which talk about adaptive radiation. Radius, of course, means in a, a, a circle. And it goes along the line that uh, in evolution, we have a great diversification, an explosion of different forms of previously closely related species, but they all started to adapt to different niches in the environment that were sought to actually not be fully utilized by somebody else. So if species land up, found a species, here is lizards in the Caribbean, uh, but the most famous example are basically Darwin's finches. So the idea goes, so if a common ancestor disperses to an environment, ideally speaking an island, but not necessarily so, uh, and several species branch off from that ancestor over a reasonably short geological time, then we get this explosion, this basically exuberance, this cornucopia of species exploiting those new uh, niches. It usually is very, very good to have geographic isolation. And it is sought to occur because the early settlers were under heavy competition, but now they are free to colonize new habitat and, uh, and exploit the previously underutilized ecological resources. Now, the guess the case is, of course, about the Galapagos Islands, and much of Darwin's thinking comes from that kind of you know, observation. And what actually happened there is it's an archipelago, it's a group of, uh, uh, of islands. They're all volcanic, they all have different ages, but they're completely isolated uh, from the mainland Peru and Chile. It uh, costs you $2,000 to fly there. So it's a great opportunity if species come from the mainland and settle there to observe founder effects, because those uh, few individuals would have brought not the entire genetic variation, but only part of it. So they can actually go immediately into a different direction. But those species then can also start to use to basically become specialized uh, to exploit all the resources, all the niches, which have not basically been occupied. And the classic case is of finches in the Galapagos Islands, where few uh, individuals are thought to have arrived from the mainland, Peru, Chile, and Bolivia. And every resource on the island, in terms of fruit types, from being a large, uh, uh, basically from one feeding on large insects in the trees, to somebody picking up seeds, you know, from the ground, has basically been occupied. And so this uh, formation, this generation, so to speak, of species to go off and occupy different ecological niches is a wonderful example of evolution in action. It can happen over a relatively short period of time. Now, many people, when they, when they talk about evolution, they think about, whoa, whoa, yeah, nature is cruel. The survival of the fittest. Uh, here we go, the pelican eating a fish, isn't that kind of cool photograph? But we actually think about nature being red in tooth and claw. It's brutal. It's a struggle for survival. Individuals die, species die. And here we got a falcon, you know, open falcon eating another one. And where does this all come from, you know? Here is a one of the greatest poems of all time is actually written by a chap called uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. And he wrote a wonderful uh, poem, you know, for his lover called In Memoriam. But there's one line in there which goes, who trusted God was love indeed and love creation's final law. So nature read in tooth and claw with reverend shrieked against his creed. So in our culture, we seem to have this idea that it's not a very benign world out there. 
Now, that is an essential element to the thinking when it comes to the concept and the mechanism of natural selection. Now, before we actually get to natural selection, which is the end point here, we need to give you, or I'd like to give you, the logic leading up to it. So Darwin basically had three different, or, uh, had, had two sets of three different inferences and observations to get us to the concept of natural selection. The first one is, essentially, uh, if you ever bought two male guinea pigs or two rabbits for your children, we had them all, and they happened to be one male and one female, you know very quickly that if you go to the pet store every day and buy more pellets, uh, uh, keep them happy, they'll just explode. Natural populations, if unchecked, have a great capacity uh, to multiply in extraordinary numbers. But Charles Darwin and many others have early on also observed that does, that does not really happen in nature. So there is actually a limit, right? And Thomas Malthus basically says, well, you know, natural resources are not there at libidum. You, there is actually an upper ceiling to it. Seems all very, very, you know, uh, pedestrian to us nowadays, but it's an important cornerstone of the logic underlying it all. So if I take uh, that idea and that idea and the idea of natural resources being limited together, so there is lots of animals or lots of individuals competing for a limited set of resources, what does this mean? Everybody tries to get to the top of it, so there is a struggle for existence. That sounds actually quite nice, a struggle for existence uh, among the organisms in the population. Right, so. Everybody has to be at the level best to get to the resources. It also means that natural populations have variation amongst the organisms. So not everybody is the same. And some of that variation is heritable. So in other words, I might have, for instance, I might be different to Bob, Bob is next door. Hello, Bob. He was actually, you know, asked me before I do an online lecture whether he can actually mow the grass. Uh, quite a nice chap. Uh, good old Bob is different. You know, he's probably a little bit shorter than me. I'm not a giant, but on average, basically, I will, you know, get the genes uh, of my height onto the next generation. And of course, there's superb intellect, you know, it goes without saying. But that actually also means that if I take the heritable traits and I take the variation of those heritable traits means that some individuals within a population will do better than others. That's a fact in life. Of course, nowadays, we also assume that all humans are different. They all have the same intellectual capabilities and same dexterity and so forth. Now, of course, that is not true. There is a bell curve of intelligence. There's a bell curve of physical ability. But you know what? We actually have decided, and it's a very, very good thing, that we have social mechanisms in place and cultural mechanisms that more or less, at least in Australia, this is a really, really cool thing, don't underestimate how deeply humanistic and valuable and fantastic the idea is of a fair go. Let's give everybody a fair go. This is actually our mechanism to cut that bit out or more or less that bit really observation number four. And that's good because we have an understanding in society and I hope it always stays like this, that the struggle for existence is something we can make much, much easier for people who are not as gifted. I think this is actually fantastic. We all should actually be, you know, enriched by society, and support. But in nature, where we don't have that social mechanism or political mechanism, basically, there's a struggle. And some people and some individuals will simply do better. And this is called natural selection.
if you basically can outrun your enemies better, if you can actually you know, eat the leaves from the taller trees, if you basically can detect, because you actually have better eyesight, a uh, predator earlier, if you can make better tools, right, to get the termites in a termite round, whatever it may be, you have a greater probability of producing more offspring, or at least live as long that you produce at least once. That's all there is. I mean, we basically struggle only in society and life so we can get our genes into the next generation. Sounds very benign, but that's basically what it is. Everything else is secondary. As a biological species, our sole goal is to push as many of our genes into the next generation. And if those genes then come with traits which are favorable, that over many, many, many generations, a new species will develop. Now that natural selection has two processes. The one is called uh, a random component and the other one is a non-random one. Bah -bah. So essentially the random one is that mutation, genetic drift, found effect creates differences. It creates variability. It creates variation. It creates the material, okay, for, uh, uh, for evolution to act. And this is completely random. M mutation does not care. It has no direction, okay? It does not preferentially prefer, uh, generate traits that are seen as better or favorable. So mutations create all sort of variation. And that's random, totally random. Uh, but then there's the non-random component which acts afterwards. And that basically means uh, that uh, environmental conditions and the response of organisms to predators on all sort of things will, on average, sort out those traits, those variations from step one, which actually make for a better survival, and particularly reproduction, because it sounds uh, very, very harsh if I say that, but in biology, uh, if you live long enough that you have produced at least once, preferably you should actually rep reproduce many, many times, and have ensured via parental care that at least one, preferably more, of your children can also grow to a reproductive age and basically reproduce, then your contribution is over. So basically, once you become a grandfather or a grandmother, biologically speaking, you are, you are useless to the genetic pool unless you reproduce again. Think about it. It's all about putting the chains into the next generation. Now, what Darwin had a problem. Uh, at the time in the 18th century, 19th century, we had no idea about you know, how the traits will get into the next generation. And that was actually a, a clear weakness of classic uh, Darwinism. So uh, essentially, when genetic came onto the uh, scene with the discovery of you know DNA molecules and modern uh, methods, it's you know the birth of what we call neo Darwinism. But also modern Darwinism, and it's it's there's a slight you know kind of word play here nuances, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, is that essentially there was this you know, uh, monk, you know, an Austrian monk working in the Czech Republic. And yeah, he was probably bored in his uh, uh, doing too much monk business. Uh, essentially, he started uh, experimenting by breeding different peas in his uh, garden, like the white flowered ones and the red flowered ones, which gave, you know, pink flowers. And, this, and, the, and the next generation had red, white, white, red, pink, pink, and red, and so forth. So you know all about that from biology, about classic Mendelian uh, genetics. And essentially, when, when those results were rediscovered, it all started to actually make sense. So we had the mechanism, and it's called the modern synthesis. It basically ties together population genetics, paleontology, biogeography, embryology, systematics, and animal behavior, all in terms of actually explaining the speciation process.
sometimes uh, evolutionary biologists tend to actually think in two different lines. Uh, the one is called microevolution, the one is called macroevolution. I don't personally like those terms too much, but never mind. I think it's a bit of an artificial divide because uh, this is the, the domain where we understand right, how genetic variation arises, what the factors are that promote it, how it actually arises, what consequence it is, has in terms of the uh, genetic makeup of population. The other one is basically you know, macroevolution, and this is basically, we're talking about large scale events, we're talking long periods of time, so we're talking about the formation and basically uh, deaths of species, and cool things like, whoa, you know, we all came over 50 million years ago. We might have actually split from the monkeys and then from the great apes, you know, uh, probably about, you know, 18, 17 million years ago, whatever. But those are actually things we like to explore over large periods, uh, over long periods and at global scales. But essentially, we now have, in many cases, the molecular understanding to do this with much more confidence. So here's a white penguin. It's an albino. It's, of course, an apparent uh, coloration. But it actually arises because some genes do not actually make for nicely black and white uh, penguins. They make for uh, basically just white ones. And so you might actually think about how, how does this actually work? You know, what actually are the ultimate forces of evolutionary change? Well. Ultimately, it's about uh, mutations. Mutations in our genetic material, in our DNA, provide, as long as they actually occur uh, in our gametes, provide the very basis upon which evolution can basically act. But then we need uh, one or two, at least, of those factors above to make this change, this random change, a reality in terms of a subset of a population going forward, more so than the other ones being left behind. And the forces basically which you know, are at place here is, some, is genetic drift, is non-random mating. For instance, an albino will preferentially mate with another albino. It's the same in humans. And this is basically what keeps a particular subset from going forward and eventually even producing a reproductive barrier. It can either be recurring mutations, it can be migration of individuals into and out of a population, and it can be natural selection. Basically, is that set of mutations or a single mutation favorable for the survival and reproduction of an individual? So essentially, mutations by itself will actually do very little for creating new species. They need one of the mechanisms above to sort, basically, the chaff from the wheat. A very, very uh, uh, widely published example are cheetahs. Now, cheetahs are, of course, fascinating animals. Of course, they're not actually very, very powerful hunters, but never mind about that. But they seem to have gone, the global cheetah population seems to have gone uh, so an incredible, you know, bottleneck at some stage, historically speaking. And they have now a very, very low genetic frequency, uh, uh, diversity. So what can actually happen is if you have a small population, that small population has a small amount of genetic variability. What can then actually happen by pure chance, a few traits, a few chains, which you know, code for a particular trait, become more popular or more frequent in that population than in another one, than in the parent population. So essentially that drift off, the frequency of traits first off by a purely random uh, uh, you know, chance event. And if the population becomes very small and cheetahs are a classic example, then genetic variation can be depleted and essentially it can actually create either in an extinction event or in a uh, basically diversification event from the uh, ancestral lineage. So what actually happens here is uh, you have a bottleneck and it actually sorts the great diversity uh, 
in, into a, in a lower one. And if that founder effect where you know uh, you have both a bottleneck of a small population and it goes into a new area, then genetic drift that eventually leads to a new species is the most likely outcome. Some migrations. Migrations basically serve often in the animal kingdom to go between different uh, uh, areas on a regular basis for you know breeding or follow food resources but genetic and this is a classic example of the wild beast in the serengeti of course but in a genetic sense it basically means individuals can go into out into a population and go out of it and eventually that can either mix genetic material up but it can also uh, uh, basically prevent uh, 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 you know, geographic separation leading to new species. So that in itself, you know, uh, would mean if you don't actually have animal movements, you know, genetic drift and geographic isolation might be much more common. So that actually almost, you know, uh, acts against, you know, the formation of new species. Now, Lots has been written about, you know, uh, natural selections or survival of the fittest, but basically it is quite simple. Organisms that have a superior combination of traits and those traits must be heritable. They must be able to be passed on to the next generation. So they must actually sit ultimately in the DNA then, you know, then that codes them for different behaviors. Uh, uh, basically have a greater chance okay to push their thing uh, their genes into the next generation so essentially their genotypes will become more frequent and more frequent okay uh, so we also there's also a school of thought about social biology where they basically argue that it is you know the the the, the, the group selection so uh, now fitness is not only measured at the level of the individual it's also measured at the level of what the contribution is to the reproductive output of the group in uh, total now non-random mating in many animals we have a system where there is an extraordinary investment <coughs> often by males who actually uh, uh, you know, this have to display uh, various attractions to females, so they actually select for that particular male, or and or they have harems, uh, and that means certain combinations of genes. Quite often, the biggest, the strongest, the best looking, the ones with the biggest horn, uh, are pushed into the next generation. So random, non-random mating is quite frequent. And of course, you know, sometimes we're actually not really uh, that different. I mean, look at this, you know, 70s porn star moustache. And a Ferrari, you know, people still buy Ferraris, particularly men uh, over 55. So I leave that to you uh, to interpret that. Oh, it's, a, it's a nice car and it's very reliable, you know, it doesn't use much petrol, but, you know, it makes a lot of grum grum. Um, yeah, I, I had my midlife crisis about 10 years ago and I bought an Alfa Romeo red. Funny that. Never mind. So, you know, pretty much the same uh, principles apply for humans here. But what it basically means that certain genes will become or will remain more frequent in the population than others if it attracts more mates and if the offspring survive so basically all of those will eventually lead to speciation events right so we have a delicate balance between mutations providing the material for speciation deck and then genetic drift and uh, uh, migration non-random mating sexual selection all modifying the amount and the direction in which the uh, mutate that the traits will actually go. There is, you know, 
uh, it's quite fascinating to see that the natural selection of quantitative traits can either be in a, a stabilizing force, so uh, it doesn't really like extremes. You can actually shift it in one direction. It's called a directional selection. So in this case here, uh, we favor you know darker snails than lighter ones. That could, for instance, be uh, the case when the climate gets uh, colder because darker snails uh, are better for you know absorbing heat from the sun. Or it actually can be disruptive. Uh, it actually favors you know two extremes. That actually often happens when a geological event you know separates the two uh, uh, populations and they land up let's say in different temperature regimes. So you actually want to be either cold adapted or the other population has to be warm adapted. But if you're kind of in the middle, you're not actually doing that well. So grand events in history, you know, when you actually uh, uh, look at the history, the paleontology of the marsupials in Australia, one thing actually strikes you and that is we used to have huge, huge marsupials. I mean, we talked about, you know, marsupial kangaroos being about three meters long and massive reptiles, massive wombats, look at those wombats and flightless birds. And they all became extinct. We don't actually, I mean, you can actually quite, I mean, I have to say, you know, if you actually, you know, have spent, you know, many, many nights camping in Africa, the Australian bush is a little bit boring. I mean, you're most likely getting bitten by a snake and die, but you know, there's nothing large which can actually devour you. But it wasn't actually always like this. So we actually had extraordinary, uh, uh, an extraordinary fauna, and there's nothing left of it. So essentially, this is what we already had at the beginning. Uh, over tens of thousands of years, you know, population genetic processes are the evolutionary mechanisms. Look at this billabong here, oh my God. I mean, that must stand about four meters high. Look at the wombat, oh, poor wombat being eaten by, by the lizard. But then we have a three meter kangaroo who is coming from the side here, never mind. But over millions of years, we talk about, you know, the rates of, uh, basically, this is the lifespan in paleontology of a species. And it's measured at millions of years. And then we got tens to hundreds of millions of years into those other episodic mass extinctions. Now, spe speciation rates differ quite uh, enormously between uh, different species. But basically, you have to actually think about that a species only has two fates. This is the speciation rate about different invertebrates. You know, and you can all see they actually went up uh, after the... Uh, I think Precambrian uh, mass extinction event, but a species can only become extinct or it gives rise to a new species. This is our fate. Some of us, you know, you know, just think about the antelope example I gave early on. They have a long lineage, such as crocodiles, and they live to the present day. But it is very unlikely that they're going to carry on forever. Something will evolve from crocodiles and from turtles, and then the original. Uh, line will actually become extinct, just like the royals, you know, well, you know, well, uh, we are still sort of, you know, a colony, people in the colonies, yeah, tell you her, maybe I should have a gin and tonic, no, it's too early, uh, and not a republic, but eventually, you know, that is the fate of all species. Now, at the grandest of scales, what we actually have observed in OS history is something really, really remarkable. We got about five really big mass extinction events. The probably most dramatic one was the Permian extinction. You know, but you know, two hundred fifty you know uh, years ago, million years ago, which wiped out nearly ninety percent of all known marine species. So boom, you know. And then what? Of course, every boy knows. And I should say, uh, uh, I should actually say this more gen and, uh, gender correct. Every child knows, and little children and big children. I found a dinosaur the other, the other day on the beach, and a big one, really nice one. And my partner, you know, said, Oh, I'll give it to the next child. And so that's what I did. Maybe I should actually get a dinosaur. In any case, uh, so they went extinct, uh, the dinosaurs. This is, of course, the you know, most well known one. 
but we actually have this over time and time again because the environment changes so dramatically and so quickly that the fire simply doesn't have a chance to adapt. So we're talking about things like massive temperature fluctuation at the ice ages, uh, could be disease, but the current thinking is most about bombardments by comets and asteroids, which change the Earth's atmosphere. The oceans might actually become uh, uninhabitable because of uh, chemical changes and so forth. So of course, you know, I mean, you can watch hundreds of animations of when the dinosaurs became extinct, and that was here uh, about 65 uh, million years ago, if I'm not uh, mistaken, because the Cretaceous extinction. This basically then gave rise to us. Hello, after the dinosaurs were gone, mammals came onto the scene. And yeah, you know, here they were walking away, the, you know, the comet or you know, big asteroid struck. I think they, they, they reckon it's now, it struck somewhere on the Mexican peninsula. Um, this is actually a foot. Wow, fantastic. Uh, but oddly enough, here is something really, really strange. So we're talking about 65 million years ago. And yet the Sunshine Coast, listen now carefully, had a dinosaur extinction event in 2015. So this is the summary point, so you can actually then use this. So quite incredulously, we have the only contemporary in recent times dinosaur extinction event right here in Coulomb on the Sunshine Coast. So, and you can even get a conversation article that poor, I think his name was Jeff, and there was an electric spark in the head because the tree went like blah, 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 and it burned to the ground. And so that population of dinosaurs at Clive Palmer's resort went extinct. Possibly the last well-documented mass extinction and it happened right here in the backyard of USC. So with this rather incredible bombshell, I leave you until uh, next week. And I hope, I do apologize for the large amount of material which we have covered today. Uh, but I think it is very important for you to understand properly the very basis of evolution because when we start talking then about biodiversity and how to preserve it you need to have that historical knowledge that mechanistic understanding that logic of explanation how all that biodiversity which is ultimately the conglomerate of different species came about right Thank you very much, and I hope the next one will be a little bit